So yes, you are right to say that it's very qualitative. There's no way to score it. So this one depends on individual and what you like. Mm. So for me, what's most important about management apart from being hardworking, hands-on, that usual stuff, I think honesty is the most important mm. because if you're honest and you have integrity, these are the people you want to park your money with, of right? Of course, yes. yes. Yeah, it's, it's a simple logic, but sadly, many investors don't think that way. Yeah, They think that honest people cannot make money. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say, right? Yeah. You're going to be cunning, only you make money. But I think- Before we begin the podcast, have you gotten your free ebook? It's called the Build a Six Figure Portfolio Guidebook. Now, inside it, we share with you the tips and tricks to bring your stock investing skills to the next level. The best part, it's only 10 pages long and it's totally free. Whether you're on Spotify or YouTube, the link to download is in the description or you can go to www.com firl.co slash f-r-e-e or www.firo.co slash free. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody back to the Firo Podcast, best place for long-term stock investors. Now today, we have uh, a legend or at worst, a legend in the making. Yeah. He is uh, a lawyer. He is an investor. He is also an author. So John is showing the, the book. The book yeah, right? it doesn't Once seem to want to focus. Uh, and he's mm. actually a very mysterious man, right? Many know yeah. him by his uh, uh, online moniker called yeah. uh, Trade View. That's right. But uh, Mr. Ng Zuhan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, MJ. Finally, Thanks, John. everyone knows what you look like. Yeah. <laughs> that you're actually a real person, not an AI bot. <laughs> right? <laughs> And, you know, we're going to get into so many things. And yes. usually I like to introduce our guests fully, but mm. I want you to ex- basically share with us, not just what you do and uh, what you do currently or what you plan to do, but really walk us through um, from the beginning, right? Your your background and also how do you come in contact with the world of money? I think uh, if those who have read my book would know that... Uh, uh, I was a blogger. I actually started out seven or eight years on i3. But of course, the reason why I blogged under TradeView was because of my corporate role. Mm. So uh, I was a lawyer by training. So I was under employment. Then later on, I was with uh, top management of some of the companies, local and uh, for, uh, Fortune 500 company. Uh, so there were employment contract terms that requires me to be strictly uh, professional in my job. So whatever side hobbies, right? Mm. That would be a bit of a contradiction if I were to reveal myself. That was the main reason why I used uh, my pen name, like Trade View. But uh, of course, it was only a hobby. I never expected it to grow to become a book, right? Mm. So uh, today I'm here is because I'm already under my own employment. I'm working for myself. I'm building my own business. So I don't have that restriction of the employment contract. So it's not that I wanted to hide behind a name <laughs> or, or because I was an AI bot. You know? no. I would love also to, to, to share. In fact, I, I thought about putting my name on the front cover of the book, mm-hmm. but no one knows who I am, right? <laughs> well, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. This. <laughs> so I thought that Trade View was a more familiar name. And of course, as a blogger, when you use this name and people is familiar, of course, you hope that uh, the readers, you can have greater outreach. Uh, and a lot of my own personal stories are in it, but mostly about my investing journey and of course right. my thoughts on money. Yeah. So before we go into your investing journey, right? We yeah. always want to know what yeah. were you like when you were young, right? Because, you know, you have uh, people like Warren Buffett, you know, yeah. seven years old, start buying stocks already. Yeah. Or ele- was it 11? I can't yeah. remember. And uh, what, was, what was your views on money? How were you raised when it comes to money? What was your background like? I think uh, like a lot of middle class children, right? So I had a very thrifty father who was actually, I would say, brilliant in managing the com- countries. Uh, sorry, the families and finances. Oh, you were, your father was managing the countries. <laughs> I'm just rich. kidding. <laughs> finance minister that we do not know about. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, the, the house, uh, our, our family's finance minister. Mm. Mm. So I think because of that, you can see the quality of life improve over time. I see. I, I think a lot of people back at our parents' generation, they're all salaried. Uh, very few are uh, yes. big time entrepreneurs. Yeah. So the only way for a middle class family to really break out of the cycle of poverty is truly really through thriftiness and saving. I That's think right. that, that is a prerequisite. 
anything extra like you know, being able to land a windfall and whatever investments or what that that is not very common back in the days mm. and of course also because Pulsar itself was developing and there were very major up cycles and down cycles not as stable or as low beta as what it is today mm. so then of course it rubs off on us so I always like to share this story like, when I also spoke on like, TEDx once or so so I, I sorry twice then I always share this story is the Vitagen story and the Kit Kat mm. story so we were growing up, my parents always wanted us to learn about the importance of appreciating what you have. Mm-hmm. So the Vitagen is five in a pack. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, right. It's that's still right. five in a pack. Correct. So <coughs> one a day for five days. That's it. On week, weekdays yeah. only, yeah. then weekend no more. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So weekend is grocery run, right? Yeah. So Kit Kat, there's a four finger Kit Kat bar. So oh, yeah. my sister and I will have to share, share. just two. <laughs> so once you finish, that's, that's it. it. It's not that we were so poor, we couldn't afford it. It's just mm. that he wanted to teach us to appreciate what we have. Mm. So it became a sort of inculcated in us. So the same thing when you were given allowance or whatever it may be, uh, we must always learn how to be more careful with our money. Uh. So mm. that has always been with me. But in terms of learning, investing or investment journey, it was much later in, in my life. Yeah. I see. Um, you shared, I know some of the viewers out there have not read his book, but... Yeah. Uh, maybe to share with those mm. who've not read, you also shared a little bit about your uh, the peers around you mm. when you started university yeah. in London. Yeah. And, mm. you know, yeah. and you know, and you know this the university you went to was a <laughs> atas university, right? <laughs> For the lack of yeah. a better word, yeah. and you had peers who were atasa. Uh, so yeah. was that what was that like? Because yeah. you came from a certain area, yeah, yeah. Uh, from a certain background, yeah. and then you're now in uh, you know fish out water in a way. Yeah. So I think um, when I was with uh, LSE, it was a very uh, eye-opening experience, not only in terms of the education experience, but rather you see the different excellence of society, mm. especially Malaysians, um, people that you would not come across in your ordinary life. Mm. You see the ultra-rich uh, tycoon children or grandchildren. Mm. Then you see the very extreme end of the poor scholars mm. who are there by virtue of their wonderful grades. Mm. And then we are somewhat caught in, in the middle so you get to see a very dynamic contrast between both. And mm. then, of course, that even <laughs> made me realize uh, the importance of money and how you value it. And coming back to my own personal intake, was there was a story right? that mm. I also shared in my book. So I remembered there was this conversation of uh, two grandchildren of a conglomerate in mm. Malaysia. And mm. they were saying, how much did uh, Ama give you Ang Pao for getting into LSE? Then she said, Oh, enough to buy a house in Zone 1, yeah. London. Then wow. the other one was just like, oh, mine was enough to buy a European car. <laughs> so I was like listening and I was thinking, what, what Ang Pao did I give? <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first real life experience of experiencing wealth disparity. Not in a bad way. In fact, it only made me appreciate what I have in life even more. Like, Governize I mean, you yeah, right in yeah, a way. Yeah, yeah it, it makes me feel that uh, I'm very thankful for my parents. Uh, without them, I wouldn't have the opportunity to study and without them, I wouldn't be able to have the, at least the equal opportunity to pursue uh, my education at a, a good university. So I think it, it sort of shaped my understanding towards how people of different backgrounds use different uh, ways to reach their goals and money being a defining item is not one that will define your life uh, perpetually. Great. Um, did you have any despise for wealth prior to that or did you oh you never had that you know i don't think i've ever had that in fact um i know that i wanted to work towards building wealth for myself one way or another whether by virtue of my profession or by virtue of building a business Mm. but of course towards there how to get there that's a more of a discovery journey it's not like a being handed down tell me that hey you got this empire to run go run it Mm. it's not like that and along the way, you just have to figure out whether which whether it's working for people or working for your own I see. self. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, so how then did all of that, uh, w- was it during your uni days where you were interested in investing or you were just having a little bit more fun? I think, I think LSE was a very, very uh, holistic education mm-hmm. experience because to be frank with you, um, it doesn't, possess one of the best campus because in a city it's called city campus so you don't have all the very nice greenery yeah and yeah that, and that's right know, it's office it's buildings. not like bath yeah or it, it? correct uh, or even cambridge or oxford right oh, it's absolutely. so beautiful it, it's not like that it's a city campus but 
when you're in the heart of London and city Lon- city of London is just a, a few uh, meters uh, down the road, you sort of uh, get uh, sucked into the whole, wow, the financial capital yes. of mm. Europe, right? So you start being exposed to it and there's so many, so many events, seminar talks by these legendary people. So there was Soros, then there was of course Greenspan and there's so many- Oh, you managed to attend, is it? Some of them, yes, uh, not all, uh, because it's so hard to get the tickets, but uh, even Ben Bernanke came during the uh, 2000 financial crisis and that time he was the Fed uh, yep. chairman, right? So it was a big deal. Mm. And when Lehman Brothers happened, I was right smack at the center because wow. I entered at 07 and the crisis started in 08 and full blown out 09. So throughout my whole university experience, it was during the meltdown. So mm. although I didn't experience 97, but I experienced the GFC back then in uh, London. So yeah. what was that like? I mean, just just curious. The oh, city. It, it was really quite bad. Why I say bad? Because even our seniors, right? It's so hard to get a job. I remember one, he did an internship at Lehman. Mm-hmm. Second year, brilliant guy, first class honors and all. Second, uh, third year, he got a full offer to join as an analyst. Wow, everyone was patting him on the back. Next thing you know, he lost his job before he even started. <laughs> wow. Imagine you work your whole universe and after after you graduate, you're jobless. Yeah. And then the careers fair usually bustling with people, hiring and everything. It was really, uh, wow, it was really bad. Uh, high recruitment in itself wasn't the same. Everyone was worried about not getting a job. Not I'm not even talking about international students. You yeah. pretty much don't have much a chance. Even the locals or The locals, like- yeah. So many of this investment banker aspirant, because as he turns out a lot of these fund, fund managers and all these financial geniuses, right, to work in the in the street. None of them at the point were were positive or at least optimistic that they would get a job. Okay. So that was how bad it was. So yeah. do you decide to leave then the country to come back, or do you still feel like many of my friends do when they study there that hey maybe I should like stay in the UK for a few years so that. You know, I can say that I've worked there, worked internationally before. I think if there was a chance, I may have, but I don't think I was at that caliber at a point in time. Another reason is because I wasn't a financial a finance major. I mm, was a uh, law degree holder. So when you talk about law, it's even harder if you want to be a practicing lawyer in uh, the chambers back in uh, London because they are limited in numbers, mm. not only for international but local. So I went to Singapore. I see. Mm. So I, I was at Singapore as a lawyer for several years. Yeah. Right, so where, where does investing come into all this? Or is it even later? Than- no, it was actually in a university. So that was when my first uh, experience. Of course, all these dignitaries or these uh, financial legends, they were there. They started to get me more interesting, uh, interested about the world of finance and and of course your classmates. And I also took a, a, a course in economics. Ah. So in LSE. So when you get a course taught by some of the best economic professors in the world, oh, that was a, a, a different experience altogether. You see things very differently and that perspective will stick with you whether you are a financial major or not. I so see. a lot of people mm. listening to us are not, uh, you know, obviously not don't, get to, study, don't yeah. get to study at LSC, I mean, let alone high finance, yeah. right? Yeah. So w- when you, I mean, I, I don't know, of course it's, not an Oxbridge, but mm. it's really close. Mm. I mean, it, it's it's yeah. uh, it's it's basically Ivy League level yeah. stuff, right? So most of us won't have an experience mm. to sit in the lecture, right? Mm-hmm. Doing. I think now on YouTube you can watch, yeah. but you know maybe when you go into learning about economics from some of the brightest minds in the UK back mm. then, right? Mm. What what struck you about them that was so different, and what can you essentially share with us some of your learnings? I think an important thing about economics is that you realize it impacts your daily life. Mm. I think it's easier to learn something that you can relate to. Yes, mm. it's just like in the sciences, right? There's chemistry, biology, and 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 physics. I can relate better to physics, but I cannot relate so well to chemistry. Mm. So it's more abstract. So coming back to economics is that I've I can see the so-called macroeconomic forces affecting my everyday life. Mm. A simple example would be Forex, right? Mm-hmm. How much is ringgit trading to yeah. Yeah. Uh, Great Britain? When well, you have to pay your fees, it, right? Precisely. Yeah. So coming back to, to, to that point, it's that because of that ability to relate to economics and, and of course a passion for it, uh, I find that it was easier for me to, to grasp the subject. I don't think so much is talent, mm. but I think it's just the interest. Right. So you mentioned about opportunities. Actually, I don't think that going to LC was the main reason alone that uh, a person should uh, consider 
studying economics or being exposed to it because the vast amount of information is now available everywhere. Mm. So, uh, there are many free online courses or whatever it may be. But the foundation that I got was actually back in, in Malaysia, right? When mm. we did the A-levels. So ah. that's when your first exposure to economics. I, I mean, I, I, I took economics because I like it. So back then, and of course, sociology. So these two were more unique subjects that I was taking for a law law degree student. And and from there, the interest grew. I, I think see. it's about interest. Mm. If you have interest, uh, anything mm. goes. Uh, that's how I look at it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, do you have any role models or someone you look up to? Because you were smack in the center of, you know, London CBD yeah, and yeah. you had all these legends. Yeah. Was there a, a role model that you remember that you would, I mean, look up to during those days? I yeah, think- it can be lecturer or whoever. La. I think not not so much my lecturers um, because I did not have enough time with them, but I've always liked uh, Warren Buffett and uh, Peter Lynch. These two were my personal favorite. Nah, if you talk about investors and then from my uh, economist, uh, standpoint, I think your usual Friedman, uh, John Keynes, all these are thinkers and philosophers of their time way ahead mm -hmm. before everyone uh, even know what this economics about. They, they actually build up the whole module structure of the study of economics. So those are necessary part of it. Then if you ask me personally, back in Malaysia, I, I like uh, Dr. Neil very much, okay. Dr. Neil, Neil Sun Ken. So I think these are the people that really motivated me to invest in the stock market per se. I yeah. see. So yeah. one thing people can glean from your book a lot is that, uh, you know, you really look to the long term whenever it comes yes. to investing. But when you started making your first investment, was it like that? <laughs> Walk me through your first investment. Yeah. In fact, the, the, the first investment is always your most memorable one <laughs> because you only have so limited amount of money. Correct. Right? That's right. So whenever I talk to people, hey, what's your first investment? I, I cannot remember. Yeah. Why? Because they lose money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I will always remember my first investment because I was in Singapore. So of course I got my first paycheck as a lawyer. It wasn't much. Then uh, at that point in time, I think iPhones weren't still the main, main, uh, uh, what what you call it? Mobile the, devices. Uh, mobile devices for MRT usage at that point in time. Mm. So I was carrying my usual Fortune and Forbes magazine and I came across a company called QL. So uh, QL is a poultry surimi company. Yeah. So I read the story and I was like blown away because it was uh, basically about Dr. Xia and the family and how they build up from nothing into what it is. And this was before Family Mart, yeah? mind yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I realized I really like this company. So I want to be part of it. How can I be a part of it? The only way is to invest in its share. Mm. So I checked how much left uh, uh, from my savings uh, after my first paycheck and I started plowing through the company. Mm. And uh, it just kept on going each month and I just buy the same company. Over oh, so it was one stock one. in the whole portfolio. Yeah, because wow. you, don't have, you don't have that much, right? Wow. Yeah. So I remember the salary was only a few thousand. Yeah, yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. So whatever that you had, you just buy. Uh, I mean, after minusing your expenses, you just buy the same company. Just same one, same one, same one. Actually, I like to peel a little bit on this. You know, yeah. a lot of people hear common advice about mm. diversification and then yeah. getting all this, yeah. right? And here you have yeah. a great example <laughs> of a focused portfolio. Yeah. Even though, yeah, Obviously you don't start as much, but yeah. what made you not look at other stocks in a way? Because I don't know anything about stocks back then. Mm. I, I mean, I do not know enough. Uh, the universe of stock market is very big. Mm. I know I can read macro trends quite well because mm. of my economics background. I know how the stock market function, mm. but I do not know how to invest in stocks the right way. Mm. So what happened is that uh, invest in something that you are familiar with and or a story that you like. So QL was a story that I like. So yeah. what what yeah. do you like about that story? Because I know <laughs> I know things in your book that yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. really find like in the annual report. And, Correct. That. Correct. and also obviously how at that point of time when the internet was not as well developed, yeah, how do yeah. you how do you, you know, find scuttle this butt. information? How do you scuttle but <laughs> so one of the main thing was of course the Forbes magazine help, you know? So the Forbes magazine subscription help. So I, I was reading it uh, you have nothing to do, you know? I was staying at Tampanese and uh, Tanjung Paga was my stop. It was probably 10 or 11 stops. Oh, yeah, so I just far. read the whole way through. And as I was looking through, then sometimes they have this uh, Forbes best under billion, you know, then look at it. But when you look at other companies, I cannot relate to it. Mm. I cannot, there wasn't a personal connection with me. But QL there was. Because one of the most attract, at what attracted me the most was when he said that, um, all my siblings, my brothers will get a share in the company. 
even though they are not playing an active part or they never contribute. Because my elder brothers gave up education just so that I can have a chance at it. Mm. And because of that, I owe them so much. And I only had this opportunity to build this great company. Mm. So when I find that a company, uh, sorry, a family that is able to withstand poverty and yet upon achieving success, able to um, show gratitude to your other siblings. I think this is the fundamental value of, of any, 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 any investors would like to see. I see. So that was easy to understand for me, right? Mm. Yes, yeah? yes. So I, I, I do not know the technical part of it, whether the balance sheet was solid you know, or whatever <laughs> wow. it may be. You know, I, 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 I totally did not know sufficiently at that, that point in time. Mm. But I knew that this is a company I want to be part of, you know? So I just put the money there and I never expected it to be what it was years later. Wow. Right. So every month you just feel like, okay, QL, yeah. where's the QL money? Where's yeah. the QL money? Correct. D- DCA QL, <laughs> <laughs> not DCA. That's really good. And I, I know, yeah. you know, before this, we're having that, uh, to, to, I think this is a cool fact for all the, the, the listeners. You were saying that this stock actually funded your wedding, right? Yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Do you want to share a little bit about Yeah, that? please. So I, I think um, years later when I had uh, to build my family, I think the first thing was you have to have a property, right? You got to pay a down payment. So yeah. QL funded quite a substantial sum of it of the down payment. Wow. Not wow. The, the whole house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so this is this is the, the, the truth of it. It funded a substantial part of the down payment. I mean, yeah. you're wow. 10%. It's not a lot of money but it was enough to get me Some started. Some people can't even get there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so that, that helped. And then of course, later on the second second time, because I entered QL twice. Why? First time was because I had to sell it for the down payment of the house. Okay. So I didn't enjoy much of the later on upside. But then when it, the price dipped, I went in again, but this time I went in for a different reason. Mm-hmm. At a point in time, I was really familiar with the, the technical, uh, not the technical charts, but the technical side of investing, which is the, the sorry, your fundamental part of investing, which is your uh, balance sheet, your cash flow. The financials. Yeah. Right? So I was very familiar with that already. But what um, gave me the promise of the future for QL, apart from the familiarity, was I saw the first family mart in uh, KL ah. I- IA2. Yeah. yeah. So there were mid value and then there was KL, KL IA2. So at that point in time, I realized that it's going to be a game changer. Mm. Why? Because at that point, um, Deloitte was doing a deal on Jaya Grocer. Ah. So Jaya Grocer, I think they net a record deal by the Ting family. La. They, they, mm. they founded Giant, right? So mm. they, they sold it. And years later, they started Jaya Grocer. And despite only have, having a paltry 2 million in net profits, I remember I think they had about 16 or 17 outlets only. Mm. They sold for a 30 times valuation. Wow, <laughs> so 60 million. I know, yeah. I think it was a value at almost 300 million. Yeah, wow. yeah. so it was quite crazy. Uh, I think the overall company, the stick that they sell, I'm not sure. Like, I see. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. overall the company, so valuation was about 300 million. Then I was thinking, how can, you know, 2 million profit? Yeah. And, and, uh, doesn't make sense, right? So I look into it again and over and over again. And then I understand, oh, it's the cash returns, mm. Mm. The, the consistent cash flow and, and need base. And there was a larger play behind it, which I think now everyone in hindsight would agree, la, you know, at a point in time. I look at it, it's, I knew that Jaya Grocer was going to cannibalize the hypermarkets. Mm. Um, everyone say that, <coughs> oh, it's so much competition, so much convenience store. Yes, Jaya Grocer was replacing a lot of this traditional mats. Yeah, that is definitely a uh, truth. But what people didn't see was how it actually cannibalized the hypermarkets. Mm. So the big box model concept no longer remained relevant uh, uh, or at least in the years to come, it wasn't. Then when I saw QL setting up the first family lot and how it was actually so much uh, more organized and with more selections, especially the food segment yeah. compared to 7-Eleven, yeah. I knew that it, was, it would be a game changer. The yeah. question is when would they break even? But if I'm a long-term investor, it doesn't matter, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So it only matters if you are on margin or you only have a, you need money in one year, which is hard for any business yeah. uh, to break even. So then I thought, why not? And I bought into KL for the second time. And thankfully, because of the market, 
cycles, I had the chance. Okay. And so I assume that this second time is going to find your man, your next mansion. mansion. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So what happened was that what, that was the one that uh, funded the the wedding. Yeah. I see. The, the second, oh, the part, second part. one. Yes. So first one. one was the house. Yeah. The oh. second one was the wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah. the third one? <laughs> <laughs> the baby. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So so I want to roll back a little bit yeah. about Jaya Grocer and yeah. also QL yeah. because. Uh, Jaya Grocer, even today, I think they are attracting bids from people like Carlisle Group and all yeah, that, right? Yeah, yeah. What's so unique and and about this this space? I I'm a big Jaya Grocer fan. Mm. I I do. MJ knows this very well. I do the groceries every week. Yeah. I I virtually love Jaya mm. Grocer because mm. queues are short. Yeah. Besides the cash flow, what do you think? You mentioned about big big box model doesn't work anymore. Mm. What makes Jaya Grocer so unique? I think ultimately how it. Uh, now, convenience mart is competitive, no doubt. Even before dry grocery and everything. Mm. Question is who can make it the cleanest, the most convenient, and most organized. In, out, get what I want and get out. Mm. So I think the price that people are paying on the premium for dry grocery, because dry grocery is not exactly cheap. Like, yeah. It's not as, as expensive as Mercato and, and some of the bigger or bands, and, like bands and all. It's not that premium range, but it's not as cheap as your pasta. Mm. You know? So. Mm, mm. What people want is clean convenience, especially the newer generation, and they did it very well. Mm. I even remembered the first outlet at the the Mutiara near near Tropicana. They hit, the security guard was facilitating the traffic wow. cars in out in out, and it was nonstop. They were yeah. very hardworking. Mm. I think these are the little things that that the management paid attention to. I think mm. probably the Thing Brothers did very well. I don't know them personally, mm. but uh, if you follow their track record, Hero Market is is is. Is their Ace Hardware is their and then their success story from Giant. I think some people are just meant for certain business, and oh, yeah. this family is just successful in this business. Yeah. The question was whether QL would be able to replicate for Family Mart. Yes. That was always something of concern, uh, for me. But I think if you believe in the management of company, which is the the the, the crux of my investment style, I think generally a good management will be a good management in any uh business that you touch, and I'm sure they have given lots of consideration before diversifying. Yeah. So coming back to this whole Jaya Grocer, do I think that it's still worth what it is or is it worth more? I think the next game changer would be how they tie up with your so-called uh, startups, uh, tech startups. What do I mean by that? Uh, think about your Amazon, right? Mm. How they do an end-to-end. -end. Mm. Fulfillment. And, yeah. So in this space, I would think something along the line of how our right hailing giant grab and uh, Jaya Grocer or even some of this Food Panda or mm. some of the marts they're opening, I think there will be some synergistic uh, play that, that at that point in time to fulfill end to end. So that is how I look at it. So if you ask me whether it's still a tra trajectory upwards, mm. definitely. And I think that's where the PE funds, are, why yeah. they are willing to buy it. It's because they see that. Yeah. yeah. Coming right. back to the point about your management. So QL, um, I don't know whether Likai is still heading mm. the family mart. Mm. And we had a joke before mm. before we came out that when we knew Likai, mm. before he took on the, mm. the, the role of heading family mart, he had black hair. <laughs> <laughs> and, and today is almost all white. You know, it's a compliment to you, Likai, if you're yeah. hearing. Yeah. But if you did not meet them, mm. how would you gain confidence? So let's just say you find a new company. Let's say company mm. X, right, mm. Han. How would you judge management? Today. I think it's very simple. Um, the first source will always be your annual report. Your reports are the one that will give you a lot of uh, idea of how they are. Mm. I've never met Hatta Legas management, mm. but it's one of my favorite company of all time. Mm. Um, not everyone have the opportunity to meet management, especially retail investors. Mm. But I mean, thankfully, thanks to all the brokers these days, they do a lot of this corporate management briefings to all your investors. Yeah. You know? So that, that has changed a lot. <laughs> But back then is that you have to look at the annual report and you match what they say mm. X year to this year. So 2019, what did they say? 2018, what did they say? 2015, mm. what did they say? Did mm. they fulfill their promises to you? Mm. Did they uh, oversell or over promote the company? The biggest no, no for me is over promotion or exaggerations. Mm. Then later on finding excuses of why I did not do it. <laughs> and whatever moves that they make, corporate moves, it has to make sense. So for example, Everyone were, there were a huge storm about QL in the forum at one point in time. I think I had only probably one ally there <laughs> when, I, when I started writing who really believed in QL. So majority of saying, ah, why QL doing Surimi? You go diversify into Family Mart and everything. But when I, I read, I understood that it's because their big client was Japan. Mm. They were selling to a lot of all these uh, 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 
what you call it, the retail chains and everything. So they had access and opportunity to the management of uh, Family Mart in mm. in Japan who took their products on and and sold in in Japan. So that was why there was a natural uh, diversification. And of course, the story is what it is today. KL had a valuation expansion. Yeah, but did it make sense? Well, very simple. At one point, it was always trading at 20 times, mm. 18 to 20 times for Surimi. Okay, and then it couldn't go any higher. So what was the next catalyst? This, then remember I said earlier, Jai Grocer was 30 times yeah. back then, right? Yes, yes. 17 outlets or, or, and with 2 million profits only. Family Bot would eventually grow to more than that store, yeah. right? Yeah. So would 30 times be outrageous? So you just take 20 plus 30. It's as simple as that. That yeah. was my thinking back then. Mm. There was a huge firestorm and everyone saying, oh, you think you're a tech company, <laughs> you know, oh, this is brick and mortar, you yeah. know, all that, all that kind of stuff. And then they said the online grocery will destroy this market and everything. But I think the market is what it is today. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt this podcast. I know it's a little bit annoying, but I want to tell you something that I think can be really helpful to you. I can tell you're really interested in the stock market and want to learn more about it so that you actually know what you're doing especially when today things are getting more complex and complicated. That's why we came up with the Stock Investing Blueprint or SIB. It's our signature e-learning program that teaches you how to pick the right stocks most of the time, buy and sell it at the best possible time and manage your stock portfolio systematically. It currently has more than 10 hours of content and it's growing you also be part of a group of like-minded investors that can help speed up your learning process. To hop on the program, click on the link in the description or go to learn.viral.co slash courses slash SIB. Yeah. I think it's at what, 50, 60, 30, yeah, something like that. Around yeah. there. Yeah. It's yeah. average about 50. So you just add, right? 20 plus 30. Yeah, correct. So <laughs> what about your thoughts on the, the future right now, right? Because obviously people... Uh, today, if, if let, let's say some new investor, right, mm. then they look at it, well, okay, I believe your story, like your mm. points are like mm. solid, but this has 60 times mm. earnings. Now, of course, this is not financial advice, right? Mm. But mm. does it make sense to you right now as- um, At this either, point in time, yeah. no. I, I don't think at this point in time, it's not, you know, I mean, at this point in time, I will not be a buyer, but I will not be a full seller until I see how the tech space play out. This tech space meaning the right hailing, potentially moving into months. Mm. You know, uh -huh. they may have to make an acquisition at that point. Will, will they buy it at a premium or will they collaborate or they'll buy a strategic stake? I don't know. That will um, further uh, unlock or be a catalyst towards the, the, the model of it. Because to be frank, offline and online will always be the best combination. Yeah. It's never uh, either or. Yeah. You cannot rely solely on that. You can, so mm. they will always have a role to play. Mm. Now, the only question is how fierce the competition because I'm sure you all know that by now, Korean marts are coming in. Oh, my yeah. news. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank yes. you, my news yeah. and EMART24 and all. So these are big players coming in and Korean waves are global, right? So yeah. uh, will Korean marts do well? I think they will. Uh, do they have a place to play in Malaysia? I think they do. Uh, well, how well will they be executed? It depends on how much you trust the My News uh, uh, management. management. I think My News is a, also a very successful story. The Dang family is is brilliant in, in building the business from a simple uh, newspaper stand to what it is today. I think um, if they can find synergistic uh, points of, for example, closing non-performing My News store, replacing with, with, with the Korean Marts and achieving some balance there, uh, they may also enjoy valuation expansion. So mm. if you ask me, is it the time to look at QL at this point? It has came down a bit because their recent performance weren't good due to the pandemic. It's not pricey as what it was. Um, but if you look at another potential re-rating catalyst play would be my and news at that because it was at the early stage of growth. But yeah. the caveat is how soon it can break even. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Actually we we spoke to the management yeah. last week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Uh we I mean, it's a good thing that the Dang family brought in mm. uh Miss Lo as the CEO. Oh. Mm. Her experience, I, I mean, for me personally, uh, I, I felt her experience was uh, good synergy la, for the family. And mm. one one caveat that we us as a few friends, investors, right, was how long would Mr. Luke or Mr. Dang mm. hold on to the legacy of the My News brand? Because obviously the CU, the CU stores will have a bigger revenue per store generation. And how long will he like, 
emotionally attached to the brand uh, rather than you know convert everything. But they gave us a very logical answer. They said, not everyone will accept a CU store. Mm. Because if you go to a slightly more rural place, the offerings may not be hmm. something of a palatable thing for the yeah. crowd. I see. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. I think there's enough room for my news and see you to coexist because they're different product segment. But I think the more important part is how they build upon that synergy. Oh, yes. Yes. Especially, for example, let's think of the back end, the central kitchen yes. or whatever it may be, the yeah. existing facilities they use or some long term lease they have in place instead of terminating and, and probably replacing. You know, So yeah. that is something that I feel. Uh, they will be able to do well. well. We'll we'll see, but I think it's an interesting story there. Okay. 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 So now uh, another guy who is really good, uh, uh, so really great manager is the the guys running MFCB, right? oh, yeah. and it's yeah. something that you talk a lot about <laughs> yeah. in your in your book. A lot of yeah. people don't know they also own a yeah. big chunk of DNO, which yeah. has flown yeah. very well in the yeah. past yeah. year. But let's not talk about DNO first. Right? <laughs> M- MFCB, right? Yeah. Um, when do you discover it? How do you discover it? And uh, why do you decide to include them in your book? I think MFCB is an interesting story because um, there was two stages to MFCB as well. The first stage is where before I knew the management and then the uh, second stage was when I subsequently got to know the management. I made okay. a mistake because I, I sold too soon MFCB and then I realized my mistake, but it was hard to get a good price to re-enter and at one, what point it was palatable. Hmm. So if you look at what I write in my book, I always believe in companies which have healthy operational cash flow and of course, um, preferable no debt or low debt. So MFCB has a big problem there, meaning that they have huge debt because mm. of the Don Sa Hong dam that they're building. Yep. So the question is that, can you trust the management to pull it off in Laos, a foreign country, mm. building a dam, mm. 260 uh, megawatts? megawatts. It's, it's not a small uh, uh, feat to uh, accomplish. So then it comes back to the management, right? Mm, yeah. So who is the management? So you have to go and research. Actually, it's all public information. It's nothing that I sort of discovered. Right? I mean, the management was uh, Mr. Gonyang Nankyo, who was the youngest uh, board of director of IGB back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then later on, he came out and then he he was the owner of Cambrew, Cambodia Brewery. At one point, it was uh, the largest beer in Cambodia, Angkor Beer. And then he was a PepsiCo joint venture partner. Mm. So I don't think Pepsi would just simply partner anyone, right? Yeah. So right. they would choose their partners very carefully and, and they had very successful run there. And then of course he started to turn around MFCB, which was once a, a huge, uh, badly in debt uh, company due to the 1997 financial crisis. Mm. He turned uh, 500 million in debt into a, a healthy company and then only grew by going into Don Sa Hong and found a new uh, cash flow, but what I liked about NFCB back then was how the management behaved. Mm. Uh, I mean, this may sound weird, I mean, why do I care about how they behave? Because a lot of people, especially companies, they always say that I got a new project, mm. I need money. Mm. Shareholders, please give me money. Mm. When a rights placement or whatever, but paying you a fantastic story, take all the money, but nothing materializes or substantial losses. Share price gets uh, whacked down and it's stuck there for many, 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 many years. So what happened with MFCB? Even despite having the need to take on so much debt, they barely conducted any placements or rights. Yes. I think what does that show you? It shows you that they are responsible, right? Mm. And as owners of them. Second, they don't take advantage of the shareholder. And they still give dividends. Yeah. And they found another revenue stream, which is by building the dam, there's construction revenue. Yes. You know? And then they ink a concession with the Laos government for uh, share, uh, power purchase agreement uh, for 25 years. So you can see the behavior of the management compared to other companies. I think this is the most important thing that we should look at. And that's why it allowed me to break my rule, right? My rule is uh, you must low fulfill debt. the uh, low debt, you know? Yeah. yeah. And which is related to this money equation. <laughs> yeah, correct, correct, correct. So yeah. I usually don't venture away from my 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 simple uh, understanding of a money equation, right? Yeah. So this one allowed me to break that rule. Mm. Why? Mm. Because I chose to believe in the M over the rest. Mm. Right, yeah, yeah. right. And mm. uh, I'm just glad that it turned out well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. just imagine you, what you said, minus 500 million in debt. And yeah. today they're going to generate almost 500 million in cash flow. It's yes. quite crazy, right? It's quite yeah. crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, way, a lot of people say that, okay, Mr. Go has done well. Yeah. MFCB has this recurring mm. cash flow. They can settle the debt. But they say, oh, but it's a, not a growth company. You know? <laughs> so what would you say to that? 
I think uh, the MJ said it very well, right? DNO, that's a growth company. If you want a growth <laughs> company, go for that. Yeah, yeah. I think MFCB is a different play altogether because mm. they have several business units. Mm. So they have their limestone division, then of course their renewable energy and all. So with this, and then now plastics, you know, they're doing very well. And then uh, now the Olio. Uh, yeah, and Olio is the next frontier. I think a uh, good management will be able to find ways to grow the business or at least sustain the income. But what you have on hand is a recurring cash flow company, mm. uh, like you say, uh, <laughs> many, many millions that our our uh, very few in Bosa can match that kind of cash flow. Yeah. And it's for the next 25 years. Correct. That's right. So unless you say something happens to the dam yeah. or something happens to the Laos government, what, wh whatever worst case scenario it may be. Otherwise, you have visibility of their cash flow and earnings in the coming years. Yeah. The question is, how are they going to spend the money? Yeah. And to me, it doesn't matter as long as, from what I understand and their management is that they prefer to settle their debt. Once they settle their debt, dividends will naturally increase. Mm. And then of course, on top of that, they'll look for other businesses, which I prefer them to take a slower pace. No rush finding the, the next business because why rush into something when you are doing very well? Yeah. And for shareholders like us, I think we are more than happy to continue to hold the stock so long as it's healthy. Yeah. And that's my perspective. Yeah. Great. Interesting. Um, now, one thing very interesting that I did not expect from a book, but I kind of <laughs> understand why you put in because I had been looking to a Malaysian company and I noticed this very subtle trend which are the trends of Taiwanese companies in Malaysia. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> I know, uh, I'm not, I can't remember if you mentioned like um, the Dufu technology, yeah. but uh, they, they will be part of it. But yeah. certainly we are all familiar with the Yuchi Tech, Yuchi Tech the Yungshin Pharmaceutical, this yeah. company and a whole host of others that yeah. I cannot remember to name. Yeah. And what was the thing that caused you to say, yeah, they deserve a mention in my in my book, right? Because, and I agree with you, they do. Yeah. They are truly, they, they've taken the, uh, what I call it, the, the Taiwanese fetish for dividends and bring it to yeah. Malaysia. Yeah. <laughs> I think one, one, one very important thing is when you talk about dividend yields, right? Dividend yeah, yeah. investing, it's a very conservative form of investing. It's suitable from people of all ages, even retirees. Yeah. So I think, it's worth a mention um, because it's some somehow <laughs> Taiwanese company has that good that, practice. That, yeah, 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 yeah. And because they have that good practice, I think it's worth mentioning because it's not a coincidence that that it's just one or two. It's almost all. <laughs> <laughs> On average, they are always above FD rate. Yeah, and they are all almost always net cash. <laughs> So what does that tell you? I tell you, it, it tells you that the management focuses on strong balance sheet, mm. strong balance sheet and rewarding the shareholders. And even if they're not growth stock, somehow they are always able to maintain the payout mm. uh, over the years, whether it is through good, good uh, management or what, operations or efficiency that they have achieved. So I think that's why it's worth a mention. And more importantly is that I think it's overlooked. Mm. Why, I, why I say it's overlooked? I, I mean, I spoke to some analysts before. I said, why don't you cover these Taiwanese companies? They said, oh, they are very low profile. They don't want to talk to. Mm. That's true. The research analysts, the IR division is 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 quite uh, camera shy or whatever it may be. Then I said, oh, okay. Because of that, you don't write about them? Said, yeah, we have no access. We can't write. So companies which are not good with all the access you can get, you write about them. So this is what I'm, <laughs> this is the point I'm trying to get, get mm, across. Mm, mm. Just because someone want to talk to you doesn't mean you should write about them. Yeah. You know, and just because the company didn't give you access doesn't mean that you shouldn't write about them. I know it's tough to get the information or whatever it may be, but then try at the AGM or whatever it may be. The fact of the matter is that good companies and the owners at times are not the showy yeah. or yeah. over promotional because only those who needs to sell, they have to sell. If you're good, you don't need to sell. That is how I look at it. That, and that's a whole value investing kind of standpoint moment. Yeah. I may not be right, you know, but that has worked for me. And similarly, my style may not work for everyone and I don't advocate it to everyone. It's just that I realized that's how, how it is. Actually, you, when you mentioned this, remember yeah. MJ when we met uh, Mr. Yeo of Dufu? Yeah. 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 And then we wanted, so we, we yeah. had a chance to meet him yeah. and he said, uh, Mr. Yu, can we record this? And said, no, no, straight away. But he said, yeah. you want to talk to me? Can. So we spent actually half an hour talking to him and he was explaining to us in very detail about yeah. uh, the new hammer drives with Seagate, all that kind of thing. But like what you say, uh, they're not showing, you know, some 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 of these CEOs, they come in straight away. My stock is undervalued. 
It's like, okay, man. Got okay, it. you know, we yeah. Mm, yeah. some flags come out. La. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tot- totally agree with you. Yeah. So that's why Taiwanese stock. But one, one another important thing is I realize Taiwanese are very good at manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, so true. that that's something that means they specialize in something. They're so good at it. Yes. And they just keep on a- achieving economy skill and then they maintain market leadership mm, position. Mm, See, mm. Welcow is a rubber hose company, right? Yeah. Rubber hose. Yeah. Who would have thought a rubber hose company can pay you five, six percent dividend? Yeah, man. yeah. Yeah. You know who pays you five, six percent? Maybank. Yeah. You know who pays you? Welcow. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to say. Then there's Superlon, who's an insulator. Then there's YSP, which is a pharma. Yeah. yeah. Then 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 there's the my my favorite of all are UG Tech, you know, which is the largest no one know, but it's I think some would know, but majority wouldn't know. They just think that, oh, it's a tech company. It's not a no, tech company. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a coffee module EDM maker and yeah. it owns um the large amount of patent in the world. Yeah. Your Siemens, your Bosch, uh, your favorite Nespresso, all takes from them. Yeah. And they look at their profit margin, look at the dividend they pay, six to seven percent. So is it undervalued? It is undervalued. <laughs> you know, it's, of course, this is not 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 me promoting the stock, but I'm just saying that if you compare to many other stocks in Bursa, yeah. which can't even pay one percent dividend, is Correct. it undervalued? It is, right? Yeah. If you if you think, you know, any of your listening thought that Super Dynamic was a good company <laughs> to invest in, right? Maybe take a look at OG Tech, right? <laughs> uh, There's another one he forgot to mention. Yeah. FBI. Ah, FBI, yes, mm. that's right. Yeah. Um, okay, FBI is a bit unique la, because it has ties with being strong, right? Yeah. So, but FBI has went up a lot yeah. um, in the past year because of riding on the, the tech team. Of course, P- PIE as well, yeah. related to Foxconn. Yeah. So all, all these are actually manufacturing-based companies. So I think the affinity or the expertise of these uh, Taiwanese companies in this sector is uh, without, without, uh, without doubt, one of the best. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So, I mean, having invested for quite a long time already, mm. right? How would you summarize the way you look at investments, your philosophy, right? Mm. Um, what are the, like, if I say that, hey, Khan, uh, mm. look at this, at this company A right now, what are the, What's the process like? You know, what's the first question asked, then the second, then the third? It's re- I think related to. Is it related to this yeah. equation? I yeah. think yeah. that's why when I wrote about this this book, my my publisher asked me. Um, so what's the acronym you're gonna use? I said, wow, oh, do I have to have acronym? <laughs> they say, oh yeah, yeah. Most of these uh, authors have an acronym. You see, Co Eyes has an acronym. And, yeah, and everyone else have an acronym. And say, oh, acronym. Okay, I'll go back think about it. So one day it just struck me while I was uh, having a chat with. Uh, my friend and then money. So it's not that I really like money that much. It's yeah. just, it w- just so happened. And it, it was in the order that I find important. So money, mon- money, M stands for management. O stands for operation, c- operational cash flow. N stands for net cash. Uh, and then this uh, e. Uh, e stands for earnings and Y stands for yield. And together, it's the money equation. I thought it was easy to remember. I thought my readers would be able to, at least before you buy a stock, think about these five points, five key matrix. And from there, um, you can at least filter out those lemons. Uh. So yeah. mm. it wasn't that I intentionally wanted to do it to sell the book, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but my publisher thought it helped and I thought the it just came. And then he said, oh, great, uh, money, everyone likes money. So that was how it came about. Yeah. And, and it's very interesting because, okay, of money, right? Mm. So let's look at the three financial statements. Operating cash flow, you've got mm. your cash flow statement. Net cash, mm. you have to look into the balance sheet. Yep. Earnings, you have to look into the PL. Yeah. And yields, you virtually have a combination of the PL and yeah. what the market tells you, right? Yep. So, but M, M is mm. very qualitative. Correct. What would you use as a benchmark? I mean, after reading, like what you said earlier, after <clears throat> getting to know management, mm. is it a gut feel? Is it like a scoring system? Is it like. I think, I think you, John, you got it right because yeah. it's just like. Um, when you choose a friend yeah. or you discover talent, it's about the people, right? Mm. So you must have an eye for talent, eye for the people. Mm. But think of it in the same way. Mm. So I always say this, um, would you want to go into business with this person? Mm. If the answer is yes, then you can invest in the company. Mm. If your answer is no, then you better not. Mm. Even if the share price keep, keep, going, up, keep yeah. going up. I think this is very important because why? Yeah, it may go up today, it may drop another day. Mm. But similarly, if you go with this person that you're comfortable with, you believe in him, you believe in the future with the person, even if the share price is not performing, someday it will perform. Mm. So yes, you are right to say that it's very qualitative. There's no way to score it. So this one depends on individual and what you like. Mm. So for me, what's most important about management, apart from being hardworking, hands-on, the usual stuff, 
I think honesty is the most important mm. because if you're honest and you have integrity, these are the people you want to park your money with, of right? Of course, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's, it's a simple logic, but sadly, many investors don't think that way. Yeah. They think that honest people cannot make money. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say, right? Yeah. You're going to be cunning, only you make money. But I think I back to defer, you know, so um, one of my favorite person, a uh, businessman is Robert Kwok. Mm. Uh, why I like him is because I think he's one of the few in Malaysia who has successfully proved that he's not only successful locally, but mm. abroad. Yeah. And he's recognized globally for his ability and affinity to do well in whatever business that he touched, la, mostly. Yeah. He has made his mistakes too. Mm. But um, what I think is most impressive about him is how he carries himself and his honesty, humility, and the way to him that sometimes profit is not everything. Mm. And because of that, most investors who have invested in his company over the years, all done very well. Mm. So for me, it's, I always ask myself, who is the next Robert Koch in our country? In mm. Even if not in the overall scheme of things, but at least in that sector. So when, when, when we talk about Glove, I see Hatta Lega and Riverstone. The Quan family, yeah, 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 Riverstone family. Yeah. yeah, so why? Because they <coughs> stick true to their what they believe in. Mm. They actually uh, work hard and they're hands-on. Mm. Um, even their next generation, uh, I mean, specifically Hatta Lega is, is succession planning is in place. So these are the qualities I appreciate in companies. Mm. So if you go to another sector, you look for the same thing. So I saw that in KL, then MFCB, I saw the same thing. Mm. So it, it gives me that kind of comfort to put my my life savings in the, in these companies. I yeah. see, yeah. I see. That's a good segue to Wilma. Because <laughs> <laughs> talk, yeah. yeah, talk about Robert Kwok. I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed his book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I found that, you know, uh, the story that really struck me was he went to build a sugar mm. plantation in Indonesia. Yep got conned by his yeah, uh, yeah. partners yeah. and then he just walked off, you know, yep. right? Yep. How many, what what makes you think, uh, or what do you think about why Malaysia, not many Malaysians will be like Robert Kwok? What, what do you think is the thing holding them back to emulate another Robert Kwok who is willing to cut his losses, never mind that people bully him or took mm. advantage of him and, and move on? Why, why do you think that that is the case? I think, uh, most people, I think myself included, yeah. if you have to suffer a loss due to being swindled or whatever it may be, mm. it's very hard to swallow, right? Mm -hmm. So I think people like Robert Koch, they are rare. It's because they have the ability to look beyond money mm. or the immediate near-term gains. Mm. So similarly, if you were to do well in investing, it should be in the same logic. If you look at a company, it's very good. And then you're suffering losses. You know, Do you cut losses immediately? or do you hold on or do you average down? This is always the main problem for retail investors. Mm. In the larger scheme of things, I cannot answer because I'm not at their level. Mm. But from a smaller scheme of things, I can I can tell you that if it's a good company and I believe in it, if it falls, I will average down, mm. provided it is a good company. And mm. fundamentally and structurally, nothing has changed. I see. So a lot of people cannot do that, right? Yeah. A lot of people say, ah, I'm down 10% cut. It's safe, <laughs> nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. It's, it's perfectly fine. But that probably to some extent, I hope answers your your question. Yes, uh, you know, from a from a larger scheme of things. Yeah. So, what's interest? What interested you about Wilma, and you know, what's yeah. your thesis to it? I think Wilma is more than a plantation player. Mm. I I'm a very, <laughs> I like integrated players mm. end to end. So at least when one is performing badly, the other will perform well. So if commodities price is high, you enjoy uh, the the windfall from it, but yeah, you also have uh, problems from the margin squeeze at the other end. Mm. So I like this because in a way, it's like a balanced portfolio. Mm. So you're diversified, right? When you're well diversified, uh, you are not that affected by the economic cycles. And I think economic cycles is the one uh, one truth la, that no matter what sector, whatever, there will always be a cycle. There's no such thing as forever green, mm. even tech sector. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people know that my stance on tech sector has been always been, I've been warning, uh, whether through my columns and, and, and my writings, I've been warning a lot of times that uh, sometimes enough is enough. Mm. You know, you must know when to stop. You know, um, if you make good money from tech sectors, I think if it's time to recognize, you should recognize. Mm. It has gone out of hand. Mm. And, this problem is not uniquely local. Yeah, it's global. Right. It's global. So everyone blames it on, or, or they 
they, they give credit to it because of the uh, central banks around the world, loose liquidity policies, and et cetera. Yeah. But I think it's more than that. Mm. I think it's the infinite belief and the potential that tech means uh, billions. Mm. The future means it's always bright. Yeah. But it's not the case, right? Yeah. So how many uh, Googles or Amazons are there in the world? If you're lucky, you can find the right one. If you're not so lucky, you can find a tier two, tier three. But mm. what about the majority that fail? Yeah. We, we, we work, remember we work? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is a spectacular example. It, it was also backed by SoftBank. Yeah. But how many investors lost money on WeWork? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So that is how I think that uh, investors should a bit be a bit cautious. Yeah. yeah. And it, it also, you know, um, yeah. wants me to probe a little bit more <laughs> about this point about you, your portfolio doesn't really yeah. cover much on the semiconductor. Is it your belief that overall the valuations are just too expensive or you just find that the businesses like it, it will always be overpriced. That's why you never go into it. What, what, what would be your take on it actually? Actually, if you look at semiconductor players, they are all very run by very skilled and professional management. Mm. That one, we have to give it to them. Mm-hmm. And uniquely placed uh, in Southeast Asia, in Penang Island, you know, all these are advantage laid down since Tan Sri, I'm uh, sorry, Tun Nim Chong Il's yeah, days. Yeah? So we have to give credit to, to the ecosystem itself. But is it worth as much as what it is today? Mm-hmm. Is it supposed to be at such premium? I do not think so. Okay. Reason is because um, it is not a disruptive technology. Mm. It's not a game-changing technology. It is a manufacturer. Mm. And at times, when we look at manufacturers, the capital-intensive requirement for reinvestment is still applicable to them, right? Yes. Whether you are maybe lesser in a lesser scale, I just saw the news this morning. I think Penta Master is expanding 120 over million. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just check back the past five years combined. I think did they make a net profit 120 over million? No. So this is something that that I'm trying to convey. Mm. So probably they took five years of profit or four years of profit to plow back into reinvestment. It means that it's as capital intensive, if not more mm. than some of the sectors. Will they do well after this? I believe they will. Mm. But to what extent? Mm. Yeah. So this is a gauge that's very difficult to say. And another thing is, it's not that I don't believe in, in semiconductor. Uh, in the early days, I, I also had front can. Mm. You know, um, I bought it and uh, I held it on uh, for quite a while. Uh, I did very well, one of my better performance stocks. But after a while, I felt that the valuation was too high. Mm. So of course, I understand that a lot of fund managers in our country uh, especially in uh, if you invest in unit trust, you would look at the growth stock, you yeah. look at the portfolio, it's always that few, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Retrox, Rankin, and all. Recently, of course, the past few years, you had UWC, Great Tech and all. Mm. Let's think back a bit. How much did they IPO for? Probably 17 times, 16 times. Yeah. yeah. Why were they? Why did they IPO at that price if it's worth so much yeah. today? Yeah. That is a question we must ask ourselves. Mm. Did the investment banker sell their client short? Or did the clients at that point in time think that 17 times, 16 times was a great valuation mm. already? Mm. So if it's worth 90, 100 times, why didn't they IPO at say 40 or 50 times half yeah. the multiple? Half. What it is? Mm. Of course, you can argue that oh, we shouldn't use PER. Okay, fine, use PEJ ratio. Mm. It's still off the marks. All mm. of them are still very, very high. Mm. So I think we are at a very unique time and it's great that they are performing well because that means that whoever they invested did well and I'm happy for whoever that did well. But sometimes enough is enough. So mm, that is right. where investors must take note of it. Mm. I'm not saying that it won't go up any further. Mm. I'm just saying that upside, downside, you know. Mm. Yeah. Risk reward. So that's yeah. a very interesting thing. And that's one of the things I want to talk about, which is the, you can say is the you portion of yeah. your money equation, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, th- there are so many thoughts and views on valuation, right? I'm, and I'm sure it's very smart people, I think <laughs> yeah, listening to what you say would be like, no, yeah. uh, you know, uh, they would say, you know, these are very treasured assets. So yeah. they're not like a mm-hmm. QL or whatever, mm-hmm. where, you mm-hmm. know, theoretically you can think of competitors coming, where these tech so-called companies is mm-hmm. a, li- a little bit harder. What are your general like sniffing tools, right? For mm-hmm. when uh, either, either a sector or company is uh, undervalued. I think you did shed some light a little bit about QL, how you think mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. a bit overvalued. Mm-hmm. 
And of course, you explain how you think that the semiconductor chain is in Malaysia is uh, overvalued. So what is what what is that sniffing tooth that you have to say this is overvalued, that is undervalued? Do you have rules to say that over a certain amount it's bad or is there something else? I think, uh, of course, you must take into prospect. If you don't take into prospect, then you're not being fair to the companies. Mm. So I know why people always say tech companies should be worth more because of the prospective growth and mm. of course profit margin and mm. all and stuff like that. Uh, coming back to your question is what is my sniffing tool? I think at the end of the day, it depends on the barrier of entry of that particular sector. Is mm. it easy to replicate? Um, whether uh, competitors can come in and flood the market, you know, whatever it may be. Alternatively, it's the the part of the future integral chain uh, of uh, whatever products that it's in demand. If they can be a part of it, then of course, then they demand certain valuations. Mm. But the question is how much? So how do you see the usual way is of course, how many years of earnings mm. it's already factored in. And another question is to ask, how much is this not caused by macro policies? Mm. Because I'm, I, I always, I think, um, spend a lot of effort on macroeconomics, uh, probably because of my background. But the reason why macroeconomics trends are so important is because while it cannot serve as a definitive guide, mm -hmm. but it can provide you a, overall perspective of where the world is heading. Mm. I think if you can have that gauge, it will uh, trickle down towards your own uh, valuation matrix towards certain stocks. So I think certain things in this world are indispensable. Mm. I think certain things in this world can be disrupted and replaced. I see. So these are the things that how I used to uh, decide whether a particular stock is valued over or under. And if it's something of essential nature, um, how important is it that we need to live with it? So I'll give a very uh, simple example. Let's talk about Glove. You know, so Glove, everyone knows that I'm a believer in Glove companies. I'm a believer in Glove companies apart from the management, but another reason is because of the unique market leadership position that Malaysia has built over the years. Mm. And uh, Glove Makers has made a astronomical amount of profits uh, mm. that I think no tech semiconductor <laughs> company can match in the next 10 years. Hatalega one quarter, two billion. Uh, yeah. so it's insane. Uh. Correct. Yeah. So, we talk about windfall taxes yeah, yeah, as well. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So my point is, you know, if you compare in that, that aspect, don't I have a great safety of margin buying glove stock? Mm -hmm. Meaning that every single year they can just have zero profits. Yeah. And I'm still safe. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. But the same cannot be said about tech, tech yeah. companies. You know? Is it? You know, and of course, we another thing we're very important is that <laughs> chips are always changing, right? Mm. So at this point in time, it was at one point thirteen, then ten, <laughs> then <laughs> now, now five. five. So it, it depends on 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 the progress, and if you cannot keep up with it, ultimately you will get phased out. Mm. And if you're unlucky, you buy the company that is eventually going to be phased out. Mm. Years ago, it was all HDD, right? Now it's no long, longer HDD. Yeah. Mm. You know, so these are the things that you have to be very careful. So glove, I will change my will if someday they tell me you don't need to wear gloves. Spray. Yes. <laughs> you spray on it and then suddenly that's it. Yeah. You know, I won't be surprised if Hata invents it. Yeah. <laughs> well, if they do, you hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an example of it. So yeah. and and why I like glove stocks is because apart from the safety of margin that is there, I think if you look at how the the Malaysian position itself in terms of glove companies, you'll be amazed. Mm. Because in my experience, I even had this uh, very interesting business deal. So one of my clients from US, um, Premier Inc., uh, at a point is one of the largest buyers of gloves and uh, mm. medical supplies and supplying to all the hospital. Okay. About four or 500 chains under yeah. them. Yeah. They came to Malaysia and they were knocking on all the doors of all the glove makers and I introduced them to one of the companies. And during the meeting, they, they hands down, they said that Malaysia's quality is the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no one can compare mm. they don't deny that they tried to stretch it you know and see whether it, the samples break or whatever I was looking at it they were even blowing the balloon you know <laughs> with it you know so it was quite amazing mm -hmm. and they were very impressed this were American buyers mm. then they talk about pricing mm. so they say oh China is cheaper you know and stuff like that so the owners and the companies were telling them that at, at the end of the day you pay a price for what it is, right? Yep. The quality is worth. Even chain, even whole. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, you, you you pay what it is, you pay pay for for its value. If it's expensive, it's expensive for a reason. If you want cheap, we can do cheap, but it won't be what you want. Mm. You know, and at the end of the day, it's true. Yeah. So how do we know whether the glove makers in Malaysia are good? You look at the rejection rate. Mm. So when the clients do the inspection, you must at least hit ninety percent. 
Otherwise, your whole container will be rejected. Mm. It's the st- same standard applicable during this whole pandemic where uh, other country uh, sub-tier glove makers are, uh, are subjected to? I don't think so because mm. the demand was was much greater than the supply. So there was need, so they overlooked it. But over time, people will still look back to the quality. Okay, And this is not only from the American buyers, but also the French defense uh, 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 corporations subsidiary that, that also approached me to reach out to one of the clients. It's the same thing. They mm. said I only one Malaysian gloves. Mm. Wow. So Europe is like that. US is like that. So unless the Chinese uh, glove makers can actually improve their quality, mm. which I believe it's a tall order because um, it requires a lot of R&D mm. and also because if you're expanding so fast, you're only focusing on volume, not focusing yeah. on the quality. Correct. That's that's the nature of, of of any business. I think that Malaysia stands a good chance to maintain its leadership position. Great. So, I mean, I'm just going to play that as okay, right? I mean, I'm not vested in any side. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I hear people say about the, uh, currently, right, the glove yep. counters, right, yep. um, that really the issue is the lack of visibility when it comes to the ASPs and of course I think you talked a little bit about the um, competition and I think for a lot of investors right now looking at the gloves no doubt they can calculate the PEs themselves they can do whatever analysis they want to do um, but they just they're just not comfortable with the the certainty uh, uncertainty or the lack of certainty so what do you say to investors who think that way who obviously disagree with you or at least are on the fence I think Invest in companies that you're comfortable. What I say may not be right. Mm. I'm confident in my view, but it doesn't mean you should be confident in mine. Because I see things from a long-term perspective. Right. It's right. the same thing during H N N N one. It's the same thing uh, in the past where they say, "Oh, yeah. glove is oversupply." Yeah. They, they, it's always the same same story. But that's why it's cheap, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you won't be able to get a stock at a, at a good price. You know. But a good company is a good company. Yeah. This one we cannot deny. You cannot say last year it was good company, this year is a bad bad company. And then because of that, you slash the valuation by this. You know, that that is I think the source of frustration for retail investors towards uh, some of these analysts. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of analyst friends and many are good qualities, but I know sometimes when they write reports, it's beyond their control. You yeah. know, yeah, I, I understand there are certain pressure elements. Hidden from, hands. Yeah, hidden hands that interfere with it, or maybe maybe some uh, elements of decision making beyond their control. But I think everyone can judge and value glove companies. And we all know objectively that uh, it's undervalued. It has made a lot of money. It's a great company. You're worried about prospects? Fine. It's normal, understandable. After a huge hike, you're always worried. So, But in my years of investing physically in my, with my own life, heart and savings, I think whatever gyration, it over time, it will normalize. Mm. It goes to the extreme end, it goes high, it goes low, it will normalize. Normalize to what? An equilibrium. Mm. And this equilibrium is where the trajectory of the company's earnings, stability and growth comes into play. Mm. And if you can extend your horizon, you don't have to worry. The problem is that majority of the retail investors are short term. Yeah, that's so, key. And, and your channel is all about long-term investing, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, my book is all about long-term investing. I did not make money from short-term trades. I can tell you that. <laughs> In fact, the greatest amount of wealth I've built over the years is through long-term holdings. And mm. I don't think anyone can question this, this um, timeless uh, investment knowledge or theory because yeah. it has worked for those before us. It has worked for um, uh, myself. And I believe it will work for the generations to come. Great, great. great. Um, um, sorry, I, I'm going to segue into um, the things we discuss about the landscape yeah. of... Sure, but I have just yeah. one more question because I, I really want to understand a little yeah. bit about... Um, you, you say that macroeconomics is very important for yeah. you to, yeah. to invest, right? Yeah. yeah. And my question would be, like, how, how does that play in the role? Because, you know, macroeconomics is a very, like, fuzzy term that a lot of people, like... You need to be Ray Dalio to understand yeah, or something you know, like, like that. To understand the whole economic <laughs> machines and whatever. Yeah. And, like, so when you say that you, you use it as a way to see the trends, right? Are you referring to, like, what? How you allow interest rates to determine your valuation? Or is it because, uh, like, I think you mentioned something interesting where you may distinguish, uh, dis- uh, distinguish between... Um, what do you call that? 
things that can be disrupted, things that cannot be disrupted. So I, I, I didn't get quite a sense of what you mean by uh, mm-hmm. how value, uh, sorry, how microeconomic affects your own overall uh, decision making. Okay, let's take the hottest topic of the day. Let's talk about the power crunch in, in, China. in China and of course some parts of the world. Why did it all, all this happen? Is it because of the pandemic? And then that's why now suddenly demand is back, then supply isn't enough? Or is it because of the climate activists and the ESG advocates mm. that actually impacted policy makings around the world and shaped economic policies in turn affecting industries and hence now supplies are insufficient to cope up with demand? I think it's the latter. Correct. And I think most people would agree with me. S- noble ideas like sustainable investing, ESG and all, it's, it's all very good. It, 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 it charts human progression in the right direction. It helps mankind, it helps save the earth. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a big uh, believer in uh, uh, sustainability because yep. I will need investing companies that are sustainable. But everything in moderation yes. and at the right pace. Yes. You cannot overnight just say that, let's all go um, electric <laughs> and forget about fossil fuel and overnight everyone goes green. I know they all set the target 2030. 2050. Yeah, yeah. you know, we, we, we all know, know that, that that is the right direction to head to. But have we at one point paused and think about what about the damage that uh, battery that's cost uh, for EV? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nickel, copper mining, all these are all, all uh, important uh, elements that are required in battery for EV. Apart from that, charging station, how many charging stations required to yeah. be built? And where does charging station gets their power from? The power grid. Where does power grid uh, generate its power from? They still use coal. Yeah. So are you ESG compliant or are you not? <laughs> so that's, these are the, the, the rhetorics um, that's that right. of course people can put forward. So it comes back to plantation. It's the same thing, isn't it? Yes. They always say, oh, oh plantation. Pump uh, oil is deforestation. Is, uh, uh, deforestation and all that kind of, kind of stuff that um, affects the valuation of palm oil stocks. But if you look at the yield per per acre, it's actually the most efficient uh, edible crop. Absolutely. Oil plantation. But why? Why? Because the hypocrisy of some of this Western lobby power, Western lobby power, not the whole Western world, but because they need to protect the interests of um, their own crop, agriculture, soy, corn. Vested interests are all this. So there are bigger forces behind things. So that's That's why I say it's important for us to look at things from a macroeconomic point of view. Then we Mm. understand certain policy directions and we go towards it. And it helps shape your decision. So for example, then I would cut my exposure towards say uh, fossil fuel. Mm. And I will tilt uh, increase in balance towards uh, 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 renewable energy, whatever it may be, uh, as a way to diversify or lower my risk uh, Mm. of exposure. So I think this is another level of investing, which is more complicated than just picking stocks. And I think that one requires a lot of reading and no one gets it right all the time. I, I got it wrong as well in, mm. in, in, in the past. Uh, and in fact, I I never expected a power crunch in China. Yeah, same here, <laughs> to be <laughs> yeah, honest. You know? So that is out of nowhere. Yeah. So you will not get absolutely like, uh, right pre- predicting economic trends, but you cannot ignore the importance of Opposite, macroeconomic absolutely. forces. Yeah. yeah. So I think if I were to uh, summarize what you said, yeah. thematic economic policies and trends mm. in a way to help you shape, and that's what you meant by macro. Yeah. La, yeah. Rather than, I think MJ was trying to clarify, rather than looking at probably fiscal policies directly yeah. or yeah. Um, yeah. monetary mm. printing policies, I think yeah. what you're saying is more the thematic kind yeah. of macro. Because it's a, it's, a, it's, a it's a big word, yeah. macroeconomics. Yeah. So I yeah. just want to get some color. Mm. Uh, before we move on to, mm. to maybe a more personal side of things, right? Yeah. Um, I, I usually ask all our guests the same question, which is uh, their views on like, the amount of cash someone should hold oh, their yeah. portfolio <laughs> yeah, and that's a di- good diversification <laughs> strategy because I think diversification is a religion, you know. Yeah. <laughs> some people say, now you need three. Why, why do you need 30? Then some people say, well, Peter Lynch did it with a thousand, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where are you on that spectrum when it comes to A, diversification and uh, B, uh, cash strategy, how many percentage you have? I think this 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 uh, comes back to a book produced, uh, written by Dr. Neil in 1980 plus. Yeah. Mm. And that's where I got my my uh, uh, local investment knowledge. He quoted a very good uh, uh, theory back in the book. And in the research, he found that um, the effect of diversification diminishes as the more stocks, number of stocks you hold. Yes. And the ideal amount at any one time uh, based on certain portfolio uh, uh, holdings is about eight to 12. So 
if any more than that, the impact gets more negligible. Mm. So of course it depends on your size. Some people's size is a Peter Lynch has so huge because he manages billions of correct, funds, right? Correct. So as a retail investor, do we need so many stocks? I don't think so. So I personally uh, am a believer in diversification. And although some people quote Warren Buffett saying that, oh no, concentration is a single way of building wealth. They, know, they, they usually say that uh, um, Buffett say, will say like uh, diversification for for ignorance, right? But yeah. the truth is we are all <laughs> a bit ignorant sometimes. Right? <laughs> and on top of that, if you look at Berkshire's portfolio, isn't it diversified? Yeah, That's right. it it's is. very diversified. So I do not know where the quote come from, this concentration is a single way to build wealth. I believe so. I did it in the early days with QL. But that's because I I do not know anything yeah. better. But over time, I realized that diversification saved me. Okay, you know, mm. an example would be glove stocks, right? Mm. If I were hundred percent or ninety percent on glove stocks, I, I my performance would be very bad this year. Okay, you know, but because I'm well diversified, so some perform well, some perform bad. You know, it levels out over the years. I yeah. see. Yeah. I see. Okay. So uh, a cash. Cash. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, cash is a very big topic these days, right? Because of crypto and and all that. I'm a non-believer in crypto, not because of anything, but rather because I do not know anything about yeah. it. Mm. So if you don't have knowledge about it, it's best not to invest in it. That's mm -hmm. my view. So cash wise to me is very important because you need to have cash to navigate yourself out of tight, tight spots. Mm. And I will always try not to go below 30% cash holding at any one time. Mm. So that means 70% invested, 30% cash at any one time. Uh -huh. right? Even if sometimes I drop to 25 or 20, I will try my best to get back to 30. I see. You know, I, I, I'll always do that because I need to navigate myself out of trouble. I see. You know, and again, this one saved me on many, many occasions. And of course, the only time I went uh, almost 90% invested was last year during the March sell-off. I see. I the think COVID I, crash. Right? Yeah. So I wrote about it a few times publicly. And I, I said that this is the time, cash is king, time to deploy. I think I wrote three back-to-back -back, uh, articles on it. And 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 that was the only, pro possibly the only time I was 90% invested. I see. Does it give you like a, I know some people have cash. I mean, we can talk about the math and yeah. all that, but some people just want to have cash for psychological reasons. <laughs> it's like, I have cash. Safe, safe. It feels safe. You know, is, is that, the, it, does that play into your decision making? I think, probably they want peace of mind, yeah. comfort. Yeah. And I think investing with a comfortable mindset is very important. Mm. That sense of ease to be able to sleep at night. Mm. So like myself personally, I never do sleep over investment, mm. never. Because mm, even in the worst of times, I think it's because I believe strongly in the companies I invest. It's mm. not that I don't make mistakes. I do make mistakes, you know, uh, no one, can tell me convincingly that they don't make mistakes. Uh, you know, even Buffett make mistakes. It's just that you must be able to recognize your mistakes. And cash provides you the avenue to correct your mistakes. Mm. So without cash, you can't correct your mistakes. So that's, that's right. why I think it's necessary to always have some cash. Mm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a good segue to talk about something I think all three of us are very passionate about. And <laughs> yeah, also yeah. about, yeah. So prior to the recording, yeah you were sharing with us uh, about what you felt was a bit of a, mm. okay, so maybe to set the context, the March COVID crash brought in a lot of investors. A lot of young, new retail investors. Yeah. Yeah. And you felt that it was a bit of an injustice where you see uh, certain groups with vested interests took advantage of these retail investors. And one of the reasons you felt that injustice was that the knowledge you've accumulated, the mistakes you've made, are not being shared, like what Dr. Neo has actually shared in his book. Yeah. And you felt that it, it was compelling enough for you to write this book. Yeah. Right? And what do you think the landscape has done to retail investors today? Well, paint us a picture of how you see it today. Actually. I think uh, what we saw last year was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. it's, we have never seen uh, retail investors come in in such short amount of time at such amount and value okay. uh, since 1997. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's even right. The right way to put it is the 1993 bull run. Correct. Then after that, the crash, you know, that was when after that, uh, Bursa had always been losing retail investor participation. Yeah. So I feel that retail investors participation reached the all time high last year uh, is something that is both uh, very uh, uh, dangerous but it's also something we should uh, welcome mm. if done the right way. Okay. And sadly, a lot of groups out there or fake gurus, I'll, I'll put it out there, is that they take, took advantage of this 
people. Mm. Um, hot money, whether is it because of the meritorium or the savings or people locked up at home, you know. If retail investors get burned, mm. they will never or they will try not to invest in stocks ever again. Mm. And that is very bad for the vibrancy of the market. Mm. And that's why I always felt a strong urge in me, whether it's a personal crusade or a, a belief that uh, we should really cherish and appreciate or treasure all these retail investors. Mm. That's why what you guys are doing amazing because you are trying to do your, in your own way, reach out to retail investors who are willing to watch your show, listen to your podcast, and at least try to do it the right way. And I think that's admirable. Mm. But there are, <laughs> at the same time, groups out there who are just trying to milk these people after you know, saying that they are value investors and fundamentals, but what they preach and what they do is different. Then they take your money and they go and buy sports car and <laughs> splurge on, on Rolexes or whatever it may be. I think that is everything that's contradictory to being a value investor. And it's very sad because these are hard-earned money by retail investors. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's not everyone is born with money. And mm. I and we all know how hard it is. Because Malaysia is not a big country, population is small. The side circle or, and or I would say the supply of money is limited. It's mm. not like US. You know, the government just keep printing and there'll be more money in the system. It's not like that. So once these people get burned, they don't believe in the stock market. Then our stock market will go back to what it was in the past 10 years, 15 years, which is pretty much a low beta market. Uh, nothing interesting pretty much uh, dominated by these uh, local funds, institutions, mm. GLCs, uh, GLCs yeah. but that's about it. And it's not going to be healthy for anyone. Yeah. And we talk a lot about financial education, financial literacy, but I see a lot of private sector doing their best, like yourself, you know, and, and some of these other authors. So when I decided to write, I felt that, okay, let me write something based on what I believe. And mm. if the readers like my book, they will adopt it or believe it. At least I share what I I think is right and mm. with a good heart la, I think a, a good intent sorry and a, a, a clear conscience I think that's all that matters to me I see what do you think mm. is the biggest struggle in what you do and what we are trying to do mm. when it comes to the retail investor because like it or not it's you know when there's a bull market all these people will start coming in and yeah. then when there's a bear market then they are also <laughs> gone the retail investors are also gone so yeah, yeah. what makes this people just keep on fall, falling for this kind of thing. I think it all comes down to greed. Okay. It, you know, because everyone wants to have uh, extra income or they want to make more money mm. for their own reasons, uh, which is fine. Mm. But they do not understand the best time to buy is during a bear market. The best time to sell is during a bull market. Yeah. They think the best time to buy is during a bull market so that they can sell at higher high. But <laughs> that's the dream, right? That's yeah. the ideal, right? Yeah. But I never make the most money during a bull market, believe it or not. Yeah. I, I, I make the most money during a bear market because mm. that's the time I buy, I position. Then I just wait. Mm. You know, it has served me very well um, over years. But like I say, it's over the years, not over months, yeah. not over days. Yeah. And some people say that uh, I'm not a believer in technicals. That's why I'm unable to do that. I think, I, think, I think it's not fair because technical charts and all, while it's uh, somewhat a, uh, guide uh, or reference i think that's what it serves that's about it yeah and it's always used to justify things that you do not understand or you cannot make sense of mm. but it's never a foolproof theorem oh. but dividend yields earnings cash flow are time tested proven theorems mm. that has shown uh why a company should exist and should do well okay and it's almost true by definition, right? <laughs> if he's going to do well, he's yeah, going to yeah. do well. Yeah. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. And and that's what I hope that retail investors picked up, not only from my book, but from your programs and all those who educate um, people in the world of finance in the same way. Because it's very sad because it's always those with flashy cars and what that, that attracts their yeah. attention, but it's <laughs> never those of substance. I think it's the same thing, right? So yeah. in life and in, in, in everything. But I hope that you know, with programs like this and shows like this, that more of them will be able to realize their dreams uh, by investing the right way. And I remember you were sharing before this podcast that uh, something that really, you know, burned within you was when you mm. heard the, and I you know I also follow your Telegram channel, yeah. so uh, I know this something you shared, what, where yeah. someone, uh, I think it was a Mandarin program, someone yeah, was yeah. calling into Oh yeah, the, that one, yeah, yeah. yeah. Calling yeah, into the, DJ the, the yeah, radio yeah. and, uh, 
and it was really emotional. You want to yeah. share that story and yeah, what you learned from it and what you can do. Because some of it are not Mandarin listeners. Yeah. 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 So they haven't. So there was this caller that called in and, and he said that he followed this group and he paid 15,000 for coaching fees. And then after that, uh, he lost a lot of money and he's contemplating suicide so that he can get the insurance payout and for his parents. Damn. Wow. Um, and he's only 39. So, and it was, uh, he was breaking down on radio. And of course, uh, DJ Chan Fong's program was to sort of help a lot of people with any mental health or any issues that it may be. And when I heard that, I felt that I've written so many, so many articles in the past. And every time I, I still, no matter how much, I, how many articles <laughs> I've written, yeah. it's always the same, same story, you know. Then he went to borrow. It, it didn't stop at just using his savings. If you deplete your savings, fine. You just, you know, rebuild. Start again, yeah. Yeah, he go and borrow and margin and, and stuff. So what's going to happen now? And for me, it struck a chord because I find that this was made worse by people who call themselves gurus. Mm. What's a guru, actually? Someone who can teach people um, like what we understand from you know, a teacher, right? But this guru is being misappropriated by these people who have no qualification whatsoever to teach. Qualification in the sense that the basic understanding of what is investing. Yeah. You know, the the, the necessary evils of investing. That means certain things, it's just no matter, even if you pick the right company, sometimes it still moves against you. Yeah. Yes, but right. no, they tell people it's guaranteed 100%. <laughs> you know, you can just borrow and just leverage how can anyone do that? Yeah. That is morally and ethically wrong. Mm. It, in fact, to me, it's bordering on criminal. Yeah. Yet, people don't learn. So it, it sort of um, affected me in a way because I felt that if through my writing, I do not call this out and I do not use the platform, however small platform that I have, to share my thoughts out there, then I'm also in a way an accomplice because I encourage people to retail, invest in the stock market. Mm. That's right. But I don't go and tell them and warn them about pitfalls. So then that's my my fault mm. as, a, as a party as well. So I just try my best and I just do what I just and include writing this book. So actually no one wants to be an author. Yeah. <laughs> it's very really a, a lot of work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So everyone thinks that being author is easy. I don't think in Malaysia, you yeah. know, not everyone is JK Rowling or Dan Brown. Let's, yeah. let's face it. Yeah. And uh, per book, mm, the, the the profit to an author is is so negligible. Yeah. It's probably uh not even worth a day's trade. Nah. Yeah. You know? But why did I choose to write and why did so many of the other local authors they they pour their heart and soul into it? It's because I think over the years they have benefited from the stock market. They mm. feel that it can be a force for good, mm. you know, for retail investors. They want that that stigma to a stock market to be sort of a, a shaded. So they they took the step to write. It's the same for me. Mm. And is my method the best? I don't think so. Mm. But it worked for me. Mm. Do you find it useful? Maybe. So mm. just give it a try. At the very least, you read it, you will feel that whatever that I'm, I'm, I'm advocating is to tell you to be careful ultimately, yeah. right? Yeah. And the same thing goes for your show. You bring up guests to your programs. You just hope that through the words of the, the guests and, and some of these people, you can convey the message that investing is good just do it the right way and be patient about it. Ultimately, you do well. That is, I think, our goal. Yeah, right, yeah right spot here. on. Uh, spot uh, on. Our goal. Yeah. It, it, there's no such thing as a, a, a what do you call it, a malice or, or other intentions behind it. Yeah. Because you don't make money uh, from this kind of things, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So unless you say that we are we are collaborating, no, no, we, we are front fronting QL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You see, <laughs> even for, for for us, what we are saying is that don't buy QL. You know, yeah. At this juncture in time, yeah. you know, yeah. just wait, be a patient. Yeah. But my point is, coming back to this, is that um, I hope that uh, retail investors, especially listeners to your show, understand that there's no shortcut to quick money. Yeah. 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 You know, speaking of pitfalls, right? I know you mentioned one, which is that uh, when, when a fake guru says um, guaranteed. So I oh, think that's yeah. one big pitfall. Yeah. But in your experience, right? Because... I, I try to put myself in the shoe, right, of someone who, you know, has a day job, works hard, has yeah. a family and all that. So they don't spend as much time thinking yeah. about investing as Correct. we do. Yeah. And so red flags are very red to us, right? Mm. But to some people, they, they can't tell the difference, yes. right? They're almost like they have astigmatism or they have, mm. color, they have mm. color blindness. And mm. so they cannot identify what's a red or green flag. Yeah. So with regards to 
fake gurus, right? Apart from when they say guaranteed profit, right? What are some of the red flags you would tell uh, the listeners? A, a checklist, lah. That means if you mm. see if you see uh, someone offering this kind of service, what would you think yeah, would yeah. be a checklist to say that oh, fishy, fishy, fishy? Yeah, what are the red flags? Yeah. yeah, I think ultimately is uh, there's a few con men always have a few uh, similarity. Okay, they're usually very uh, flashy. Okay. Uh, they like to show off. Yep. Um, they know, somehow they don't understand the meaning of humility. Mm. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, they always talk with a sense of um, uh, narcissism. So they think that they are always right mm. and they think that their word is the, the way forward. And, I see. And all these are very simple telltales. Maybe just think of it this way. Is if these fake gurus are someone that you wouldn't like to be friends with. Mm. you know. So those are the people that you should avoid. Apart from all these things that you can see, I think an important thing is consistency between what they say on a Monday and a Friday or when a good market or bad times. Mm. You know, of course, maybe it's hard for you to differentiate whether this person has knowledge or not because you yourself may not be well-versed in this space. So whatever they say may seem or appear to be knowledge. But I think consistency is important. Consistency meaning if A, on a, on a, or on a rainy day or, sh- or, on a, or on a shiny day, they say different tune and it keeps flipping, uh, flip-flopping between positions, that is a very good telltale. Mm. You know, a person that believes in certain things, they are consistent and, and, and throughout. Unless it's something that is really outright, you know, caught them out of surprise, then fine, you know, it can be excused. But if today you say you are fundamental, the next day you're technical, the next day you're fundamental plus technical, <laughs> what are you? Yeah. Okay, I'm an overall guru. <laughs> but then you're selling your value investing guru. I yeah. don't think that's how it works, right? Yeah. Mm. Then if you say you're value investing, then you say, I don't look at dividend yield. I look mm. at growth. Mm. Then when growth stock is performing, you say, I look at growth. I don't need to look at, you know, I'll just share with you all this story. I think you all will like it. Yeah. So there was this chat group. Uh, I think it started off from i3 and then he has 2,000 over people in the chat group. So he said that expensive stocks are the best stocks to buy. Expensive mean like like massive price, like, you know, right expensive in terms of PE valuation. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The higher the PE, the better. Wow, okay. okay. So the, the people ask him, why? Oh, think of it like AMS bag and Rolex. Why? Expensive, right? Yeah, expensive. <laughs> the more expensive, only people want. You see, everyone fighting for it also cannot get. <laughs> Low PE means cheap. <laughs> cheap stocks. Who won? No one won. <laughs> Understand not? So that is how you invest. Can you imagine? That is how he justify to the investors to buy tech stocks. <laughs> wow. And there's 2,000 over people. Now, wow. how many out of the 2,000? All you need is 10%. Yeah. And this 10% probably, they lose their life savings yeah. if they listen to it. Yeah. Because they will think that tech stocks are AMS back or Rolex or, and, and go with the same mindset. So these people talks with such theories that defy common sense and logic. Mm. And it is important for us as retail investors to be very careful. Just like if your health is bad, do you go and listen to one doctor or you go and listen to several doctors? So if you're not sure, just check with a few yeah. others. Cross-check mm. them. Even what I'm saying today may not be right. You right. may not agree with me. Yeah. Go listen and check out other know, guys. Yeah, cross-check. And then from there, you can make a more uh, informed decision. So I think one of the big issues as well and why these fake gurus are so successful is because they always play to the sins and emotions mm. of the average person or yes. everyone. Yep. And I think when it comes to the stock market, the big one is greed and mm. subs- and linked to that impatience because right? mm. people want money now, yep. wants to wait yep. for so long, right? Yep. So obviously you talk about how people can identify some of these uh, mm-hmm. fake gurus, mm. but also what would you say to the person who who is struggling with waiting because you know the money is in the waiting, right? But they don't want to wait. So what are some of your tips, right? To be that person who just sits on his investment? I think if you think of it, um, that you're investing for your children, uh, that's mm. how, how I, I always convince myself. So um, in the front cover of my book is what I, I impart the wisdom to my yeah. child. I said that true investment uh, takes a long time to pay the, in, the dividend at times spanning generations. So this is my gift to her mm. and hopefully that she will always remember because yeah, I can leave money, right? But e- eventually you, you used it. But if I leave this wisdom, then at least you always understand that. Mm. So if you think that you're doing this for your children's education, for example, mm. you leave it there by the time she's 18, or 19 and it's time to go off to college, you will be surprised that your nest for her college education fund is- More than sufficient. Yeah. 
So that is what I would try to convince those. Don't invest for yourself. Mm. Invest for your next generation. Then you may say, oh, I'm, I'm silly because well, why I don't want to spend the money on myself. <laughs> yeah, sure. that's right, right? Yeah. yeah, but the money at the end of the day, when it comes, it will be so much that's enough for yourself and the next generation yeah. right? because you're willing to wait. Mm. So, but provided it's a good company, it must come back. Of course, of course. Don't invest in a company that disappear after <laughs> two, three years. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, when he said this, right? It was the green packets of this world, right? Yeah, uh, no, because we, we have a team of researchers, yeah, uh, yeah, Han, yeah. and um, he's actually a quantity surveyor yeah, by training. Yeah. And he was like telling his colleagues about, it's actually Gabe, yeah. right? The other Gabe, uh, right? The yeah. other Gabe. So he said, he told his colleagues, hey, you know, if you invested in Vitrox, uh, you would have made a hundred X. And then his colleagues asked how long? 15 years. I cannot laugh, 15 years. Cannot wait. Uh. 100x, 15 yeah, years. Yeah. For him, it was like a no-brainer. Like yeah, yeah. He's very embodied. But I think it was more to echo your point about people not being patient. And I think one good way he said is your children. Yeah, yeah. And, and really, if I understand what you're saying correctly, right? actually, it's about an internal transformation for a person that yeah. is not about you. Yeah. Right? And I think part of the reason, and I talk to friends and family, is that they tend to say that I want to spend the money now. I don't spend yeah. money when I'm old and all that. But actually, if you take away and saying it's not about you, it's not for you. And my belief has always been that if you do something for other people, it's going to it's going to be a lot better anyway, right? Better than just stacking up hundreds or millions as well, <laughs> right? So I, 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 I think that's what you would uh, agree with me. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, MJ. And then another important thing is think of it like an EPF. Yeah, mm. you, know, you cannot withdraw. Much. You can't withdraw, but <laughs> except for this year. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, why yeah. our market is going through such a disruptive year from yeah. the normal C. Actually, I've never seen EPF sell the way it does. It's okay, frightening. Wow. It's, it's extremely frightening because if not for retail investors, if not for last minute some foreign funds coming in, I think our bursa would be in a, in a bad shape. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I've never seen anything like this. So everything got a price. So allowing redrawals from the EPF program has sort of caused our market to uh, go through a disequilibrium. Okay. So coming back to what you say, MJ, I totally agree with you. And another important thing is always to think about what is your purpose to invest in the first place. Yeah. If you want fast money, you might as well go for 4D or you go for Genting, your, uh? Genting or whatever it may be, right? Yeah. Not promoting Genting, but <laughs> just uh, sharing that. You no, know, that's it's very simple, right? Big or small. Yeah. You win big, you go go big. You, you lose, you go home. It's as simple as that. Yeah. But stock market investing is not like that at yeah. all. Yeah. And, and that's where I just hope that through your program, I can just share that the stock market in itself is not a gateway to quick richness. Yeah but it's a gateway to building wealth. Yeah. If you think of that perspective in that way, then um, I think you will be able to sit longer. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to our earlier conversation about yeah. Dr. Neo and all yeah. that. And also, yeah, so I, I'll start off with the current foreign, yeah. the forumers, yeah. or what we call celebrity forumers. Yeah. What do you think of the landscape and how are they using their influence, are they doing it well? Are they doing it not so well? I think, uh, John, this question is uh, quite timely. Another reason is because I started off as a blogger. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, I started seven, eight years ago in I3 as an unknown writer and I was just thinking that maybe I just practice my writing skills. Correct, correct. <laughs> you know, and something, a topic I like. I never imagined years later I would be an author of a book. I never expected to be a mainstream colon, uh, financial columnist on Starbiz Weekly yeah. or Nanyang. So it was never the end goal, to mm. be frank with you. Mm. But I found I treat to be very useful back in the days, mm. especially in as a, a congregation of information and uh, sharing of not only uh, information, but also good news source, right? Mm. Some source news porters need to pay, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Down there you get, get all kinds of information. I really enjoyed the forums back in the days, but it has gotten from uh, um, uh, very uh, satisfactory level to uh, a toxic place today. Mm. And it's quite sad because in a way it's infiltrated by some of these operation syndicates um, and all this, uh, I don't know what you call them, uh, trolls or whatever it may be. Mm. The worst, however, is still the celebrity gurus. Yes. You know, why, why, why I find them the worst is because they know they have influence on the market mm. by, by virtue of their stature. Yeah. And yet, instead of using it for good, they use it for themselves. Now, some 
<laughs> listeners would think, what's wrong? Using it for myself to make money. Sure, but at whose expense? Yes. And the retail investors who are pro- possibly just a housewife looking to supplement an income so that she can buy a school uniform for the child or a nicer shoe or a birthday present. Yeah. Have they thought about it? Or oh, then you might say that, oh, it's a zero sum game. That's the stock market. I don't agree that the stock market should be a zero sum game because mm. the stock market, if you invest in a good company, it grows, your wealth grows, no one loses. It yeah. can be a, a space of such. But because of the human complexity and emotions, it makes this gyration in the market and it makes it irrational. Mm. Irrationality is good for value investors. Yes. There, right, John, yeah. you know, so it's good for us. But it's not good for the common people because that's right. If you do not dare to buy during a dip, you will just cut and you will just keep making losses and yeah. it just keep piling up. So this celebrity uh forumers has outsized influence and they may show themselves to be altruistic and kind, but they do not actually look at the welfare of the people, mm. which I think is wrong. Mm. So this is where I like to contrast with someone like say Dr. Neil. Mm. You know, Dr. Neil Sungian is someone's book who I've read and I find it to be still relevant despite so many years. And despite having such overwhelming influence uh, in terms of the literature of financial education in the country, or even co eyes for that matter. Yeah, co eye. Yeah. You do not see them using their influence to enrich themselves at expense of others. Yeah. So to all people who believe in celebrity gurus or or this uh Invest, we call them prominent investors. Mm. I think it is necessary for you to reflect and look back at how these people have been behaving over the years and judge their track record. Mm. Because at the end of the day, you may not be a victim today. You may end up being a victim someday. That's right. And it may not be you, it may be your family. So with that in mind, I think it's necessary for us to distinguish uh, separate wheat from chef, right? Mm. So then we decide which one is the right people or, or right uh influence that we should follow and, and work towards the better, uh, less toxic environment for investing. Yeah. I, yeah, I think the struggle for most, especially new investors, yeah. is that they don't have the skill to separate the wheat and the shaft. What would advice would you give them actually? I think it's it's a bit of homework. I, yeah. I understand that at first glance, a person may have a rosy track record, uh, sorry, a rosy CV. Mm. You know, he may be a founder of s- several listed companies and he may be old, and he may even wise looking, wise, wise you know, wise. do a lot of kind white hair, yeah, you know. But it doesn't mean that he has the best intention. Mm. Just look at his track record. Mm. Look at what he has said on a Monday and a Friday or the month before, and look at these stocks that he's been covering. Mm. Once you look at it, then you know whether this person is consistent, truthful, and honest. Or not. Mm. And then, if the person say he has a golden rule, but his golden rule can become a non-rule. And then it can be an exception to the rule. Then the rule is not golden anymore. Many, many, many Don't exceptions. Or <laughs> yeah. Something else. yeah, it can become something else altogether. So when you have a principle, you stick to it, right? Yeah. If you keep switching your principle, this person is no different from a frog, right? Yeah. So that that is what I'm trying to say to all out there. You just need to do a little bit of homework. Mm. If you do not or refuse or cannot do the homework, do not invest. Buy an ETF, lo? buy yeah. a unit trust. Uh, that's all. Yeah. Because it's it's as simple as that. Because anything in life, right? We just need to make effort, and that includes investing. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think it's I think true. the last one is so true because a lot of people think that they can shortcut their <laughs> investing journey. Yeah. By you know, like the the DJ Chan Fong is like, <laughs> I have a list of stocks. You know, this influence group. I have a list. Of, I just buy, follow that. They've already done the research and mm. they take 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 hands off. I think that's something that I don't think you promote to your readers. Yeah. And what we promote is that. Even though we've done some of the research, you still have to do your own due diligence. Uh. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And of course, gauge the track record. I yeah. think that's very important. Yeah. And if you see that something is not right or you sense something is fishy, then don't be masked by the hello of this uh, prominent investor because sometimes it's all shared. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Great. Okay. Do you have any more questions? No. I have one final question. I yeah. think, uh, you yeah. know, we always leave the juicy ones to the end. <laughs> so what, oh gosh, uh, wow. what, what do you think uh, is, what, what do you see the future to be in the investment landscape and uh, as well as yourself personally? Where where would you like, it's basically, where, where do you see yourself in five years? It's an interview question, right? <laughs> and of course, specific to the investment landscape, right? What, 
how you position your portfolio today? Mm. Okay, um, I never go for short term thematic. So right. I'm always a balanced portfolio. So mm. I'll always have a little of everything. Mm. But uh, there are always certain consistency. Uh, so it's again the matrix, the cash flow, the yields, the management. So if you ask me how I look at my portfolio now, five years or even 10 years or even 15 years from now, it's mm. the same thing. Mm. There'll be a healthy balance of dividend yielding stocks that provides me the so-called the recurring additional income mm -hmm. with uh, little concern for the share price. Okay. And then there will always be some high growth stocks. And then of course, there will always be some um, stocks that I hope to hedge against the potential Forex impact. So there will always be some exporting stocks, mm. you know, and then there will always be your um, banks, you know, uh, stable blue chip uh, consumer SM FMCG stocks. These mm. are always the things that I look at. I see. And, this balanced portfolio will always be the same with certain tilts based on the macroeconomic condition mm. or the policies. I personally feel that there are a lot of potential for Bursa to grow. Mm. When I came up with the title okay. Once Upon a Time in Bursa, it's because I felt that I wanted to tell the stories of our local stock market. The champions uh, in yeah, a way. Yeah. And I think people can relate to stories. And I believe Bursa will continue to churn out very good stories. And as long as we believe in certain story and we want to be part of stories, then these are the companies you should invest in. It may not be suited for me, but it may suit you, you know? So coming back to MJ's question is that, where do I see myself in five years? I believe I will still be writing mm. um, passionately. I don't think a second book will be- ah, Just about that. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't think- the This one not thick enough, like, <laughs> you have to double the thickness. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't think a second book will be in, in, the, in the near term, maybe, uh, the next cycle, which is probably 10 years later. But in the meantime, maybe a translation would be good because mm. I speak Mandarin as well. Mm. And I hope to play a part to the Chinese investors, Chinese speaking investors who find uh, uh, my book a bit uh, complex for them in this language. So I would like to potentially consider with my publisher's blessing, a Chinese version. And personally, I will still continue to do a lot of investing. And I hope that ultimately that whatever that I do, uh, benefits the retail investors at least tilt the balance uh, a little yeah. bit a little bit in their face just do your part right? yeah and i think i will still continue to write some hard hitting pieces at times oh, looking forward yes, looking at, forward at, man. at times uh, you know yeah. I, I i i personally don't think that i'm in the most qualified position to do so but i absolutely am certain that my intention is always of the best for the yeah. retail investors. Great, great. And with that, uh, we have to sadly call an end to I, this I, podcast. Do you mind if I just ask yep. one? Because we both are parents and we <laughs> yeah, are single, yeah. so sorry, you don't qualify. I'm just kidding, just yeah. kidding. You have a kid. Yeah. When do you think you want to get her started? Oh, this is a good question. <laughs> I think it's, it's up to her interest. Huh? And at the end of the day, it's whether she finds it uh, uh, enticing she may find it boring okay. but i think the time to get her started is when she can finally sit down and complete my book oh mm. so you asked her to start if, reading no, the no. book the day when it comes yeah ah. when she eventually be able to sit down and read the book then yeah okay because okay. i think my book is quite simple okay and i think it's good enough if she can start off yeah. i see yeah okay great with that awesome man like to her, this is going to be <laughs> Neil Sun Kian's book. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, with that, you know, we got a call and unfortunately to this podcast. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank for you so much. We're looking for round two, man. Round two, three, four, five. You <laughs> know? Thanks, yeah. thanks a lot for having me and I really appreciate it. Uh, this is my first interview and yes. with you guys, I'm honoured to be a part of Actually, we are very we honoured honored as well. Yeah. That, uh, that we, you know, finally we get to <laughs> unmask <laughs> the mysterious uh, trade view. And guys, do you guys enjoy this kind of, uh, yeah. actually you guys got any questions oh, about- before that, uh, where can people buy yeah, the book? Yeah, where can we buy the book and where yeah. can people find oh. you as well? I yeah. think uh, MPH and Popular is selling it. Okay. So yeah. I think feel free to go to MPH or, or Popular. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, it's performing quite well on MPH despite the MCO and, and all. And ultimately, I think um, oh, you can look here. at me at uh, Telegram or yeah. my website, tradeview.my. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, why isn't there an ebook like on Amazon? <laughs> I, so, think I, see, I, I think that is the question for my publisher because uh, they run the show. John Lim, yeah. okay. I've been trying to bring you on the show. If you're listening, you better come yeah. because I've already interviewed two of your authors. <laughs> <laughs> no, three. Three of his authors. Right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So for those who are listening, if you guys want to ask questions, you can just go straight to mm. what uh, uh, Han mentioned or if you guys want to ask in the YouTube comment section, you can do that. We'll just direct the questions yeah. to Han. And, uh, you know, 
come watch some of our other um, videos. If you like this sort of content, uh, see you in the next one. Thank you again, Han. Okay.